Hello, friends. So one of my favorite things about Theology and Raw is engaging with my Patreon community. So we're going to do something special with my community that I've actually never done before. My family and I, we are going to record the first ever, what do we call it? Sprinkle Family Theology in the Raw episode where we will respond to questions sent in by my Patreon supporters. I'm actually kind of nervous about this episode because I've been encouraging my wife and kids to be super honest with whatever question comes in. And I'm honestly a little scared about what they're going to say. So um, we're going to do it. It's scheduled. We're going to roll the dice with this one. And we're going to release this bonus episode exclusively to the Theology and Raw Patreon community in early December. If you want access to this crazy episode, then you need to first join the Patreon community at patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw and joining Patreon not only helps support the theology in the raw ministry, but it also gets you access to all kinds of premium content, um, monthly zoom chats, special written content, monthly bonus Q and a episodes, and much, much more. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw. I will see you there. Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Theology in a Raw. My guest today is Scott Harrison, who is the founder and CEO of Charity Water, an organization aimed at bringing clean water to every person on the planet. He's also the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Thirst, a story of redemption, compassion, and a mission to bring clean water to the world. Scott's got an amazing story. I know a lot of you probably already know who he is. Maybe you're familiar with Charity Water. It's an incredible, incredible organization. He's got a pretty amazing story, which he tells in this podcast conversation. So please welcome to the show for the first time, the one and only Scott Harrison. Scott, thanks so much for being on Theology Raw. I have been looking forward to this conversation for, uh, well, a few weeks now. Um, and as I told you offline, uh, Charity Water has, has kind of uh, taken over my household in many ways. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for this time. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself for those who don't know about Cherry Water, Scott Harrison, who are you and, and what is it that you do? Sure. Um, well, I have been uh, started an organization called Charity Water. We're a, a nonprofit. I started in New York City about 17 years ago. And we have a very simple mission, which is to try to bring clean water. Uh, to every single person on the planet. And sadly, you know, as we record this, uh, this morning, there are 703 million human beings uh, around the world that are drinking uh, dirty, diseased, contaminated water. So it's about, there's about one in 10 people alive, Mm. you know, don't have access to this thing that, you know, I'm sure so many listeners, uh, like me at, at times, just take for granted you know, this thing that we've always known of clean water. So we, we work across 29 different nations. Uh, we fund about 14 water technologies hmm. across the portfolio. So everything from, um, you know, bio sand filters to drilling wells to these huge, you know, multi-million dollar gravity fed solar systems wow. uh, connecting networks of villages. So we're, we're agnostic when it comes to the solution, but the great thing about, you know, now almost two decades in clean water is that we know how to help every single person alive. There's, there's no one anywhere in the world where we're scratching our heads saying, just couldn't get to them, you know, could, couldn't help them. And look, uh, I'm sure we, we both know people who are working on, uh, on thorny disease, you know, issues, right? Trying to solve ALS or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or my mom, you know, died of pancreatic cancer in, in a few months and people had no idea, you know, what to do with late stage pancreatic. But you know, the beauty is water is not like that. We just, uh, sadly, we haven't created the will to solve this problem. We haven't mobilized the resources or the community, mm-hmm. but it is nice knowing it's a solvable problem. It mm-hmm. does not have to be this way. Wow. Well, let's, I got a bunch of questions about, yeah, the current work you're doing. Can you tell, give us the backstory. How, how did you get into this? Yeah. Is this something you just wake up one day and want to provide clean water to people? Or? Well, <laughs> you know, I, uh, no. So it's a, it's certainly not the, the most traditional path. Um, I grew up in a very conservative Christian family. Um, my mom became an invalid when I was four years old. There was a tragic uh, carbon monoxide gas leak in our house. And, uh, my dad and I got sick. We eventually recovered, but really my mom, uh, her immune system irreparably shut down. Mm. And from that point on, her body was unable to process, uh, anything chemical. So she kind of lived in, in a bubble. Uh, she lived in, in isolation. You know, I, I, I joke, uh, sadly that, you know, I have 40, 40 plus years of experience with three M's family of masks. Oh, wow. You know, from the time of the accident, I never really saw my mom's face again. Wow. She was always wearing, 
you know, so a version of an N95. And so, you know, I was, I was brought up, I was an only child caregiver role, played Sunday, you know, played piano in the Sunday school. And uh, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't sleep around, I didn't cuss, uh, you know, d- didn't, uh, you know, I played by the rules. <laughs> and if you'd asked me as a teenager, uh, I was going to be a good Christian doctor mm-hmm. when I, when I grew up and I was going to cure my mom and other people like her. Um, uh, well, uh, it didn't work out that way. Uh, and at 18, you know, I took a pretty big detour and really lived out, uh, the, the you know, classic cliche, uh, prodigal son story, you know, woke up one day and said, now it's my turn. It is my turn to go have sex and yeah. smoke and drink and, you know, get it out of your system. Go have, yeah, go, go live like, the uh, you know, the, you know, the pornography and like, you know, and, and I and I realized that um, there was kind of this uh, very unique opportunity in New York City to rebel in style uh, if you became a nightclub promoter. So you know, you can imagine to the horror of my group and <laughs> you know the the little old ladies uh, who'd been praying for you know for for Scott Harrison. Um, I I kind of go rogue and spend uh, ten years, the next ten years, uh-huh. really just most selfish, hedonistic, uh, debauched <laughs> lifestyle, um, which looked great on the outside. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm working at 40 different clubs, you know, over the course of my career. I drive a BMW. I've got a grand piano in my New York City apartment. You know, I date girls that are on the cover of fashion magazines and I'm flying on other people's private planes to these exotic wow. you know, vacation locations. But, you know, it was really an empty uh, existence. And at 28 years old, uh, there was this moment where half my body went numb. Mm. And I remember being in my loft in Midtown, walking over to uh, the sink, turning on the water, uh, hot, where I could see it steaming, and just running my hand and my arm underneath it, and I couldn't feel anything. Oh, wow. And I thought something was very wrong with me. Uh, maybe it was a brain tumor and maybe some you know, incurable disease. And it really just led me very quickly to assess my life and the path that I'd been on, uh, the legacy that I was leaving, which uh, was, was actually a destructive mm-hmm. legacy. And, you know, led me to question, you know, some of that stuff that I, I was taught in church. Mm-hmm. You know, did I believe in heaven and hell? Uh, you know, if, if I, if I still did, I was pretty sure where I was going. Uh, the, the one saved, uh, always saved theology didn't feel like it would work too well after the way I'd lived for, for 10 years. Uh, so, you know, really started this exploration to kind of rediscover faith, rediscover morality, um, you know, maybe in a different way as a 28 year old. And, um, I got this kind of crazy idea to start life over, sell everything I owned, and see if I could volunteer for one year Hmm. on a humanitarian mission uh, and see if I could be useful. Did I have any skills that could be useful to others? Um, Well, the, the, you know, I I remember, um, uh, you know, I'd grabbed this, I'd kind of gone on this journey. I'd grabbed a Bible. I'd grabbed a bottle of Dewar's, a carton of Marlboro Reds. Uh, had rented this car and just headed north from New York City. And aimlessly, I didn't know where I was going. And I eventually wound up in Moosehead Lake in Maine in this little dial-up internet cafe. I remember these old <laughs> Dell computers, you know, that yeah. were stacked high. And, and I applied there uh, to volunteer for you know, 10 or so uh, of the, the famous humanitarian organizations I'd heard of, you know, mm-hmm. certainly had not donated to, but had heard of like World Vision and yeah. Save the Children and Doctors Without Borders and Oxfam and Red Cross Salvation Army. And, and you know, maybe it shouldn't have been to my surprise, but, but certainly to my, um, you know, to my sadness, nobody would take me. <laughs> so I was denied by all these organizations because it turns out that none of them are looking for accomplished nightclub promoters. <laughs> uh, Doctors Without Borders, it turns out, is looking for, for medical professionals <laughs> to go. So I, I had gone to NYU part-time. I'd graduated with a communications degree, you know, kind of C-minus student, mm-hmm. barely graduated. Uh, but I had dusted this degree off and sent it to one organization uh, called Mercy Ships that was operating a hospital ship uh, off the coast of West Africa. And I said, they had this position open for a photojournalist. 
for a writer and a photographer. And I said, well, I can do both of these mm. things. I'm a hobby photographer. I like taking pictures of models uh, and beautiful <laughs> buildings in Prague and Paris and Milan. And, um, and, and I'm a pretty good writer. Uh, and, and I actually have this degree <laughs> that I've never used to, to show for it. So a, as the story goes, uh, the organization saw my resume and actually discarded it at first. But then they were about to start this mission and they had not yet filled this position. So they had to go through the discarded resumes. They found mine and they agreed to meet me. Uh, and I remember that was the moment where I had to convince them that I really was trying to change my life. I really was trying to turn over a new leaf and that I would not throw any wild parties uh, on their hospital ship uh, or, or corrupt any of the young nurses. <laughs> and, and I successfully was able to convince them that, uh, that, that I would not do any of these things. And, you know, in a very, very short time, my life changed so radically as I, um, had this moment where I was going to surrender my passport, walk up the gangway uh, onto this 522 foot hospital ship with 350 volunteer crew and really sail away to a new life, mm. uh, a, a completely different life. And I remember going out with a bang that night. I, I smoked, you know, two or three packs of Marlboro Reds and you know, I got drunk. <laughs> I'm like, this is, you know, at least, at least I did to finish well, <laughs> but, but, you know, made, made this commitment that I would never touch drugs again. I would never smoke again. Uh, you know, I would never look at another pornographic image again. You know, I really wanted to kind of mm -hmm. clean up my life and see where this might take me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was something nice about, uh, being on a ship with a bunch of humanitarians where none of that stuff was cool anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like doctors are smoking 40 cigarettes a day. Right. <laughs> so that really started this amazing journey, uh, in West Africa, uh, where we were going to a country called Liberia, hmm. which at the time I'd never even heard of, uh, I couldn't have found it on a map, but it was this, uh, post-war environment where uh, a brutal civil war of 14 years had just ended. Uh, the warlord Charles Taylor had fled and there was no electricity, no running water, no sewage, no mail system in the country. And most importantly, in our context, there was one doctor for every 50,000 people living oh, there. Wow. And here in America, we have a doctor for every a couple hundred of us. Wow. So the, the work was, was really needed that these doctors were providing. And I was just going to be responsible for documenting everything that happened on and off the ship um, for the medical library and you know, all the patients that would come through surgery. And uh, it, it was, it was an amazing kind of new beginning for me. Wow. That's crazy. What, um, is that when you saw the issue of clean water as well? Was that, did, it, did that come right away or would, did that come kind of down the road? Yeah. Well, during the first year, I mean, I, I remember, there was this really cathartic moment for me. It was my third day in West Africa. And before the ship had brought, um, you know, this, this huge, before the ship came into the port, a small advance team had flyered the country advertising the coming of the doctors. Mm. And they posted these, these banners that said, if you have a facial tumor, mm -hmm. if you have a cleft lip or a cleft palate, if you uh, have been burned by rebel soldiers during the war and you need facial reconstruction or body reconstruction, mm -hmm. Um, if you have flesh eating disease, I mean, stuff that I'd never even heard of, mm. you turn up on this day and our doctors will triage you um, and, and, you know, we'll help as many people as possible. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, waking up at five o'clock in the morning, my third day in Africa, grabbing my Nikon D1X cameras, putting on the hospital scrubs. And I'd, I'd learned that we had 1500 available surgery slips to hand out. Uh, and I remember just thinking, you know, are there 1,500 sick people with these bizarre conditions? Mm -hmm. I mean, 1,500 people with tumors on their face. And I had learned that the government had given us the soccer stadium in the center of the city mm -hmm. to, to triage people. And, you know, about 5.30 in the morning, you know, our, our convoy of Land Rovers snaked through the city and turned up at the stadium and there were more than 5,000 people oh standing in the word. parking lot wow. waiting for us to open the doors. And, you know, that hit me really hard. You know, we're going to send 3,000 sick people home mm. with no chance to see a doctor. We don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough resources. 
So yeah, that was that was a really difficult moment. I, I, I later learned many of these people had walked from neighboring countries. Oh They'd God. walked for more than a month with their children just in the hope of seeing a doctor or a surgeon. So that first year, um, you know, I really tried to focus on the the hope, and I was documenting all fifteen hundred people uh, as they came through the surgery process and just watching lives completely transformed. Mm. Watching these doctors save lives, and I, when the year ended, I, I wasn't sure what was next, so I just signed up for a second year, and that's really where I I got off of the ship, you know, out of the city and into the rural areas, mm. and I saw the water problem for the first time with my own eyes. Mm. I remember just watching children drink from you know green viscous algae filled swamps. And you know, just kind of saying to myself, well, no wonder everybody's sick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if the most basic need for health is not met and, and people are poisoning themselves with dirty water, no wonder we have 5,000 people uh, gathered outside a, a soccer stadium. Mm. And I kind of learned two, two things. Half the country was actually drinking unsafe water and didn't have access to sanitation. And according to the World Health Organization, Half the disease was because people were drinking dirty water and didn't have access to sanitation. So for me, it was it was uncovering, you know, the question kind of behind the question yeah. of why are all these people sick? Well, well, it's because they don't have the most basic need met. And I remember showing my photos to Dr. Gary Parker, who was the chief medical officer for more than 20 years on the ship. And he just kind of simply challenged me to go out and do something about it. Mm. You know, you've seen this. It seems like you're passionate. Why don't you go and try to bring clean water to everybody on earth? <laughs> and, you know, I was 30 at the time. So I was like, okay, I'll try and do that. <laughs> I mean, if you told me to jump off a bridge, I might have. I mean, he was kind of the, the, the highly venerated, yeah. esteemed, um, you know, moral compass of the ship. And it was really that simple. At the end of the second tour, I came back to Manhattan. I was completely broke. So I started living on a closet floor of a friend's apartment for free rent. And I was telling everybody, uh, I'm going to go on a mission to bring clean and safe drinking water to everybody on earth and help as many people before I die. Wow. That was that moment was 17 years ago. So what would the next, how do you start an organ? I mean, your organization is massive. Like how, what, what, what were the early days? What did that look like? I mean, um, well, I think I had the advantage of not knowing anything about how to start a charity, um, or run a charity. Yeah. Uh, people don't believe this, but I actually bought nonprofits for dummies. You know, one of the yellow dummy books. <laughs> like actually there's, an <laughs> I actually, but there is a nonprofits for dummies book. In fact, I, I continue to recommend this to others. I mean, it's a great, you know. yeah. um, and you know, I, I had the advantage of knowing everyday people who went to nightclubs or worked at Chase Bank mm -hmm. or Sephora or, you know, MTV VH1 at the time, you know, they were in the, the entertainment business yeah. in some way. And as I, as I talked to people about what I'd seen, cause I, I had been emailing my whole club list. Mm -hmm. that I had amassed over 10 years, all of my photos and stories <laughs> from, from Africa. So, you know, there were definitely some unsubscribes uh, in the beginning, <laughs> but, you know, people were following this journey and they were really interested yeah. in the, the transformative work these doctors were doing in Africa. So I came back with a little bit of credibility you know, having been there for two years and having you know, told these stories through photos and video and, um, and, and through words. So people thought the mission of getting people clean water was a noble idea, mm -hmm. but I realized so many of them were cynical and skeptical about giving money to charities. Uh, and everybody seemed to have some sort of horror story they could pull out of their back pocket yeah. of charity gone wrong. Yeah. You know, a charity that embezzled the money or, you know, was, was nepotistic and, you know, it hired cousins and aunts and, you know, uncles far removed and put them all on the payroll. And, as I kind of probed this, you know, I learned well two things. Seventy percent of Americans, polled by uh, NYU, actually uh, found uh, they found seventy percent of Americans believe charities waste their money. Wow, so that's that's surprising yeah. to people. I mean, Americans are known as unbelievably generous, right? As mm -hmm. we compare American giving to other nations, but seven out of ten people think charities are not good stewards mm. of those dollars. 
42% of people that were polled by USA Today said, you know, we just don't trust charities. So I thought, you know, maybe there is a way to, you know, and again, nobody was using the word disrupt 20 years ago, but, you know, maybe there's a way to do something different, to reinvent or reimagine the way a charity could be structured, the way it could act and behave and report back to its, its donor community um, on, on impact. And I really just had a couple simple ideas at the beginning. The first was, what if I could tell the public that 100% of whatever they might give to help people get clean water yeah. would go directly to those people, to the field, um, that, the, that they would pay no overhead, mm -hmm. um, no staff salaries, no office rent, no toner for the Epson copy machine, uh, <laughs> no flights to the field. And uh, the way that I did that is I just opened up two separately audited bank accounts and kind of raised my hand and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there and do my best to raise all of this unsexy overhead money yeah. from a small group of business leaders, uh, board members, you know, people who understand there are these costs mm -hmm. in an organization, but it would never be the public's problem. Right. So that turned out to be incredibly differentiating uh, and you know, the reason why for many years people told us they were giving, sometimes even giving their first charitable gift was this hundred percent model, yeah. um, which, which we still today, 17 years later, have two separately audited bank accounts and about 130 families pay the overhead okay. so that millions of donors can give in the purest way possible. So that was kind of number one. Huh. Number two was then, well, if money's not fungible, if we're not you're grouping it all together in one bank account, then why don't we build technology that tracks these donations and show people where their money went mm. and who was impacted by those gifts? Um, the, one of the first things we did was become the first uh, charity in the world just to geolocate every completed water project on Google Earth and then Google Maps. Wow. So, I mean, this dates me. We we started before there was Google Maps, okay? Because <laughs> I remember meeting the founder <laughs> at a conference. Um, so, you know, we became, you know, the, the idea there was people could see the satellite images of where their money was going as these projects were being built. They were, they were delivering clean water and life to people and just wanting to build this radically transparent organization. Now, the third pillar was really around brand. Now, I remember, you know, being this 30 year old kid looking around at charities and just saying, where's the Apple? You yeah. know, where's the Nike? <laughs> Where is the Virgin? Yeah. Um, where's the creativity? Where's the magic? Where's the inspiration? You know, I saw a lot of shame and guilt. Yeah. Um, I saw a lot of, you know, old marketing, right? The kids with sad eyes and slow motion and a fly lands on the kid's forehead and yeah. you know, locks eyes with the camera yeah. as the appeal comes up. But the, the brands that I was most inspired by didn't market that way. Yeah, I mean, Nike didn't go out and tell American they were fat and lazy, you know, to stop eating Doritos and go buy their clothes and go exercise, right? <laughs> Nike told stories of, of people overcoming adversity, uh, people kind of finding within themselves more than they thought possible to go out and achieve. And that was inspiring. And people would say, well, you know, maybe I could go and run one block, mm -hmm. right? Maybe I could even run one kilometer one day. So I, I, I really thought very intentionally about trying to build this epic, imaginative, inspiring brand that was based on hope and opportunity and not guilt. So those were the three big ideas, give away 100%, prove where their money goes, build a brand. And then the, the fourth was just, I believe for the work to be culturally appropriate and sustainable in the long run, it would need to be led by the locals in each of these countries that we worked. Yeah. Like no, no guy like me from Manhattan should be running around Uganda with a hard hat on pretending that I know how to drill a well. Yeah. <laughs> um, our job would be to go and find the local skilled hydrogeologists in Uganda, get them the training, the resources, the additional rigs, the additional support trucks that they needed and help scale those local organizations um, and, and if we were successful, creating thousands of local jobs mm -hmm. in each of these countries as we grew and scaled, and they'd also be the ones getting the credit. Yeah. They'd also be the ones leading their communities and leading their countries forward into the future. So I kind of put all of that together, and the best idea I had uh, 17 years ago was to throw myself uh, a birthday party in a nightclub. So that was day one of Charity Water. 
And uh, I had gotten a club donated during Fashion Week in New York City. Um, I, I was turning 31 on September 7th. And I just uh, I invited every single person that I'd ever met. I mean, I blasted every email that I had and said, come to my 31st birthday party. And on the way in, there was this big plexi box. And you had to <laughs> donate $20 to get inside. And at the end of the night, we'd collected $15,000 mm -hmm. in that box. And uh, I don't, I don't get to tell this story much, but I remember that there was this wad of $500 in cash and it was from a weed dealer. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember he came up to me and he said, this is, I have never given to a charity in my entire <laughs> life, but I know that hundred percent of this $500 is going to help someone. Huh. And you know, that, that, that yeah. would not be a future market <laughs> for charity <laughs> water, <laughs> but you know, it kind of told us something was working. You know, this idea of restoring faith, this 100% model, this issue of water, you know, would be compelling. So at the end of the, the night, you know, we, I remember we carefully photographed the $15,000. We double counted it, a bunch of people signed stuff, you know, took it down to the bank. Okay. And then we, we built our first well in northern Uganda in a, an internally displaced persons camp. Um, we wish we had the resources to do more, but we did one. Mm -hmm. And then we sent the photos and the GPS coordinates and video back to those 700 people. Mm. And we said, you came, you gave $20, and here is the impact of those collective wow. donations that you were a part of. And again, we just realized this was so rare, organizations closing the loop, that people said, well, when's the next event? How do I bring my friends? Mm. What's the next action I can take with, with your organization? I would imagine, um I don't, I don't want to say easy sell, but kind of. I mean, most human beings with some kind of moral compass can really get on board with what you're doing, right? Especially the way you go about it. You're 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 showing them exactly where their money goes. Your um, your you know the the hundred percent, you know, um, giving goes to the actual cause. I mean, these are these are things that I, most human beings I meet who aren't even religious, you know, would say that that's, that's a good thing. I would, I would like to help that. Well, have you experienced that? Is it, has it been yeah. kind of an easy sell for lack of better terms? I don't, you know, I don't know if that's the right language, but. So Preston, when people understand the issue, uh, we have them. Um, when you understand that if you don't have water, it, it so radically impacts health, mm -hmm. it impacts women and girls, you know, who are wasting hundreds of millions of hours walking for dirty water. Mm -hmm. uh, it impacts education as half of the schools in the developing world don't have water for their students, don't have toilets for their students. Uh, it impacts the local economy, mm -hmm. uh, all this money spent on healthcare costs. Uh, again, this, this wasted time that could be income generating that, that's, that's not realized. So once we tell the story yeah. <clears throat> and it's also visual, um, you know, if people, we, we have a video online that's gotten over 100 million views across platforms. So you can go to YouTube and type in The Spring uh, or just Charity Water. When you see people, when you see children mm -hmm. drinking dirty water, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is, <laughs> you, no one thinks that's a good idea. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, <clears throat> I made seven, seven speeches last week and I was telling a bunch of kids at the last one, I said, look, you know, I probably talk 100 times a year. No one in 17 years has told me to stop. I mean, I never come off a stage and someone pulls me to the side and yeah. says, hey, Scott, hey, Scott, let, let them die of bad water. You know, let, let the women walk. Yeah. Let them be raped at the water hole, you know, or attacked by hyenas or lions, you know, as they're six hours away from their home and their children, right? No, no one that gets it yeah. wants humans to die of bad, bad water. However, the challenge is, I mean, we're going to round up 100% of the people I'm talking to have never experienced this issue. You've never had to drink bad water in your entire life because of the privilege you were born into. Right. You could be middle, lower class and, and never have had to, you could be lower class, you know, regardless of economic status, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people that I talk to have never experienced the problem. Now, if I said, hey, I'm raising money for uh, cancer research, 100% of the people listening have been affected by cancer. Mm. Right. We have we have a friend, we have a family member, we have a loved one, mm -hmm. uh, a coworker. Um, so if you think of so many of these issues that people respond to, mm -hmm. you know, it really starts with the education and the awareness. And then, yes, uh, you know, people are are all in, at least on the idea of clean water. But you know, a lot of people are surprised. You know, I had a conversation yesterday. It was just reminding 
reminded that of all American philanthropy, um, and, and this would be true for, for Europe and, and many other places you know, overseas as well, 96% of our money stays here. Really? Only 4% of all giving goes over there wow. to help people in need. You know, only 4% of giving is reaching our arms uh, across an ocean to be a good neighbor hmm. for people who are needlessly suffering. Uh, so uh, that's also a challenge, right? We're kind of fighting for yeah. 4% of the pie, and then we're fighting for an issue yeah. that no one has ever experienced. So there isn't that empathy. Exiles in Babylon 2024. That's right, folks, we're doing it again. Our third annual Exiles in Babylon conference will be held on April 18th through the 20th, uh, 2024 here in Boise, Idaho. And this one is going to be an absolute barn burner, as we say here in Idaho. The topics we're gonna discuss are uh, deconstruction and the church. And we're gonna actually hear from people who have deconstructed and others who maybe should have deconstructed but didn't. We're also gonna discuss women, power and abuse in the church, which is obviously a huge issue that we absolutely need to discuss. Um, we're going to talk about faith and sexuality, specifically how can churches become places where uh, LGBTQ or same-sex attracted Christians can flourish within a traditional sexual ethic. Lastly, we're going to discuss, can't believe we're doing this one, we're going to discuss politics. That's right, politics and the church where we're going to have uh, various speakers present. We're going to have a right-leaning Christian, a left-leaning Christian, and a... I don't know, what do you call them, a nonpartisan or Anabaptist-ish Christian, share their perspectives, um, share their perspective, and they're, we're going to put them all in conversation with each other. And of course, we're going to have Evan Wickham and Tanika Wyatt uh, leading us in worship throughout the weekend. I really, really, really want to mix it up this year. We're going to hear from leading thinkers in each of these areas. We're going to... Um, we're going to be having different viewpoints in conversation with each other. It's going to be honest. It's going to be raw. And you're not going to want to miss out. I really think this one's going to fill up quickly. So if you want to attend in person, Boise, Idaho, April 18th through the 20th, register very, very soon. Just go to theologyintheraw.com. That's theologyintheraw.com. I really hope to see you there. I'm surprised with, with such a basic human necessity and how it's led to so many problems, as you explain, even even economically. I mean, if you yeah, if you if you if you, if you follow the 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 trail of where you, how dirty water affects an entire society on so many levels, how, how is why it, haven't we solved this yet? Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, has, have there been attempts to just they just haven't been as intentional or or um clear or maybe they're, they're maybe maybe they were one of these corrupt charities or whatever that went under like who have, have people yeah. not tried to address this problem um i mean I, obviously the answer is yes but how hasn't it taken yeah, off a couple of things i mean we, we've made a lot of progress so when i started there were 1.2 billion people without water billion so as shocking as that is yeah one in six people alive were drinking bad water wow 17 years ago so now we're at one in 10. So we've grown global population and we reduced the number by 500 million or so. Wow. I will say a, a large part of that progress was in urban, urban environments, so cities and towns. And now 82% of the people without water on earth live in rural communities. Okay. So it, it gets much harder, but we have made a lot of progress. You know, I think sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, we've been dumping all this money into Africa and India and, you know, these, these countries in Southeast Asia. You know, we can show on almost any metric the massive reduction in extreme poverty. Mm, yeah. So it, it is working. Now, is it enough? <laughs> no. It's a fraction of really what's needed to take us all the way there. I mean, so so as shocking as 700 million people without water is, I mean, this is this is twice the population of America. Yeah. If you think of every single America that double it, you know, that's the amount of people globally that are living without their most basic need met. But that's down considerably mm -hmm. from you know almost double the problem yeah. 20 years ago. Is it primarily, you mentioned Africa, is it primarily Africa or where else in the world is there a huge a 35, problem? 35-40% okay. in Africa, a big problem in India, a big problem in Southeast Asia okay. you know, through Indonesia, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam. Uh, okay. you know, many of the, the developing nations over there, less so now in Central and South America, a lot of progress has been made, okay. you know, in, in, um, you know, in the Americas. And you're working in all these countries or we're working in 29, 29 different countries. Wow. Okay. 
Can you give us some stats? Like, um, I mean, on your website, again, everything you, I, I will second the, the, what you said about the, the branding, the clarity, the education. I mean, this is how just a few weeks ago, my family just got totally hooked on what you're doing. We watched that 20 minute video and it just blew my, I think I watched it twice. My wife, I think my wife's watched like nine times or something. And <laughs> anybody she meets, she, she'll be like, Hey, come watch this video, you know? So she's uh you should hire her. She would be a good, uh, um, <laughs> advocate. Um, uh, so how, so since you started, you said, is it your organization alone or just in general, it's gone from 1.2 billion? In in general. Two, okay. so Yep. So in general, so, you know, this, this would be governments investing in water themselves. Um, you know, that's another question I get a lot is like, well, what are the governments doing? Yeah. Well, they are investing in, in water infrastructure. Yeah. The problem is, you know, many of these countries, the GDP is, is so it's a fraction of what people might expect or a fraction of what's needed to meet the resources. <clears throat> there's, there's one country we work in, you know, millions and millions of people there, their entire country budget is less than New York City's mm -hmm. school district budget in Manhattan. Oh, wow. You know, so you've got, a, you've got a country that says, well, we need to take this money and we need to do roads and we need to do power and we need to do healthcare and we need to do education. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say I was, I, I got to take my, my young kids to Uganda for the first time uh, earlier uh, this year and we landed in Entebbe and um, <clears throat> I've probably been there 10 times or so uh, in, in Uganda. But it was really encouraging to see a big banner mm. saying, you know, Ugandan water coverage is now at 67%. Mm. Thanks for paying your taxes. Uh, huh. so to see, you know, governments both talk about how far they have to go because, you know, 33% uh, is an enormous amount of people without clean water yeah. living in Uganda. But there, there has been more of a concerted effort to to use you know either international dollars like ours uh, to accelerate work and to allocate more dollars to water. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've helped uh, seventeen point four million people. Okay. Yeah. It's about a thousand Madison Square Gardens full of people. Yeah. You know, so it's it's <laughs> certainly you know an an impact. If you put that against seven hundred, you know, our what we've done against the current problem is about one fortieth. Okay. Two and a half percent. Yeah. Um, I will say, you know, we're we're the largest water charity in America by you know almost three x. So it's an underfunded sector. Yeah. Um, we we want everybody to grow. We want more people to raise their hand and say, you know, I'm interested in education. I'm interested in health. I'm interested in empowering women and girls. I can do all those things by water. Yeah. Because water sits underneath so many of the world's problems, so many of the human problems. So I think we, we want not just, you know, Charity Water's community to grow, but really the, the movement for water to grow. I'll also say, you know, we don't have that billionaire philanthropist. You know, we don't have the Gates. We, you know, he was an advocate for vaccines, right? And, yeah. and, um, and then later sanitation. You know, we don't have the Bloomberg. I mean, you know, Elon would be great. I mean, he's looking for water 142 million miles away on Mars. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, I think interplanetary life is cool. But, you know, as you look down, like, what if, what if we gave Earth clean water? You know, wouldn't, yeah. that, wouldn't that be a nice thing to do? So I, I think we also are just missing that, the, the, the corporation, the, the philanthropist that's raising their hand and saying, I, I'm going to go and get this done. You know, until that, we've tried to amass millions of people like your wife and the yeah. people in her small group to say everyday people can contribute $40 a month yeah. to a problem like this. I, it's, and I, every month, you know, that one person gets clean water. I like that better, though. I, cause I, 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 run, I, I help run a nonprofit as well. And, and you know, we, we, we navigate the kind of the, the small number of bigger donors and the massive number of smaller yeah. donors and everything. But that, that and, and both are needed. But there's something sweet, I think, about. I mean, I'm, I'm both ends, right? Yeah. You know, both ends. I'd, I'd like to see, you know, massive capital going to this, this problem, you know, from a, from a Bezos or a Gates or yeah. you know, a Bloomberg or, a, um, and, you know, alongside this army of people, because it's, it actually is going to take both. Yeah. You should um, have, I, uh, I'm like you, I get way more excited about, uh, you know, an 89 year old lady that told me she saw the video online and she's giving $10 a month off of her pension. <laughs> And she knows that every four months, 
<laughs> one person is getting clean water because of her ten dollar month giving. I, that's yeah. that's way more exciting uh, for me as well. Her check and that comes in the mail. Another, yeah. You know, or the kid that sends in eight dollars and yeah. thirteen cents of lemonade money. Yeah. You know, in like actual cash in yeah. an envelope to the office. You know, and she's drawn a picture of a well in Africa and says, you know, I want people to stop dying of bad water. I mean, that's yeah. the stuff that that inspires us and 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 really keeps us kind of animated. Yeah. You know, solving this really big problem. I bet the DeVosses could get excited about this. You haven't not, no DeVos money. They're they're believers. They love this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um they've they've contributed oh, okay. over these. It's yeah. interesting. Some of their kids have really oh, yeah. uh, have gotten involved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, we find a lot. It's it's um, younger generations of mm. people. You know, so maybe maybe not the founders of of some of the companies. Maybe not even their kids. It's like the grandkids. Yeah, you know, are really excited about global citizenship, about about issues like this. How do you deal? I, first of all, I love love love. This is one of my questions, and you answered it. The the how do you avoid the kind of white savior you know mentality yeah. that you know you give the impression that you know everybody in Africa needs somebody in America to give them clean water rather than, Hey, you, the water is in your land. You can do this. Um, so I love that you try that. You seems like you're very comfortable. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's nobody that looks like me <laughs> yeah. uh, working on a water project in Cambodia or Laos or Malawi or Uganda yeah. or. Yeah, I love no that. How, how have you, so people the other missionaries I know that have the same kind of perspective, they said, you know, the challenge is you deal, you do have to, especially in poorer countries, yet there's a lot of corruption, you know? And so it, it can be really tricky as you try to empower local leaders, or whatever, to, you know, to, to make sure you're empowering the right ones. Have you ran into that issue? And how do you, how do you deal with that? Like avoiding, you know, working with a corrupt organization that seems like they're, sure. you know, great at the beginning or. Well, we, you know, we now have 17 years of experience. I'll put it that way. And we <laughs> yeah. have a team of, of people, both internal and external audit, uh, audit functions. And, you know, I'll just say there, there are a lot of best practices that, that you implement. And, you know, we have suspended partners before mm -hmm. if receipts for gas and a drilling rig don't add up. Okay. So there's, you know, there's such a high level of accountability throughout the process, right? And I mean, this is an organization now we, we raised over $800 million. Wow. So it, it's at scale. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's a deep bench of experience, both in finance. Um, I mean, our CFO was at National Geographic for 10 years uh, and then ran the Parks Department. So we've got these really senior leaders who bring uh, a high level of rigor and, um, and, and a high level of expectations when it comes to you know, fiduciary uh, quality mm -hmm. and accountability. Um, you know, can things continue to go wrong? I, I will say one of the things that maybe has surprised me the most is as I think about the problems that we've dealt with over the last 17 years, it's not been people, you know, sticking their hand in the cookie jar. It's been well-intentioned work done poorly. Okay. It's like the contractor who builds a house and it sinks into the foundation. Um, <laughs> You know, because some of the materials uh, maybe were were inferior. Okay. You know, it's pipes coming in from the Emirates, let's say, and it's a bad batch of pipes that crack mm -hmm. and the wells leak um, and need to be kind of you know rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. um, it's naturally occurring iron in the groundwater in parts of Uganda, which would rot out pipes that would need to then be replaced out with, you know, with a different material that's impervious to that. So, you know, if I think about the biggest challenges that okay. we face, it's around sustainability. It's around um, sometimes the education, you know, sometimes the, the software around the, the, the hardware, mm -hmm. you know, the well cost, yeah. making sure that the water committee is set up and is properly running the water point is keeping it clean is, is collecting enough money to pay for that ongoing maintenance, mm -hmm. you know, I mentioned 14 technologies. We just talk about one because people are familiar with drilling wells. Mm -hmm. A well is like a car. I mean, your car needs maintenance. It needs an oil change. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to need brake pads at some point, you know, maybe the catalytic converter. And you need to have money for these repairs over time. So a huge amount of time, resources, uh, money goes into the training and equipping, again, of the local leaders. So you know, you're going to see in a, in a, let's say, a Malawi water committee, you're going to see four women, four men, a committee of eight. Everybody's agreeing on how much money needs to be collected from the users of that well mm -hmm. 
to go into the bank account to make these repairs that are coming up in six months and at 12 months and at 18 months. Um, the women are always the treasurers, so they're always the ones in charge of the money. Uh, and you know, th that, that not going, you know, I'll give you an example, uh, the money that is in the water account being used to save the chief's son who's dying of malaria, mm. you know, would be a bigger challenge yeah. than, you know, someone stealing the money. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. You, um, how much, I'm curious, how much does it cost to put in a well on average? Is it, is it fairly cheap? In, it's about 10 to 12,000. And how country. much for maintenance? Like how much would you raise out the door for a uh, breed is drill? So that the maintenance is covered by the communities. So oh, we, they do the um, they have to cover the cost of the maintenance. So they're invested the in the maintenance. Yes. Now I will say in many of these countries we have set up mechanics businesses, maintenance businesses. So uh -huh. we have we have paid those startup costs. Okay. Uh, in Ethiopia, for example, we we trained seventeen people on seventeen motorbikes that would go out and respond, kind of make oh, service yeah. calls. I mean, think of this as like Apple Care for Wells or the Geek Squad. <laughs> You're really you know, in the Apple. In, I love in, it. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's a Best Buy reference. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and, and one of the other things that we've been innovating in is we have sensor technology now. So we have uh, over 10,000 cloud-connected wells. So uh, we are able to monitor the daily flow rates and a local partner gets notified if the well breaks, if water stops flowing through the sensor and then can dispatch a mechanic out there with the tools. You know, many of these repairs are really simple. I mean, many of these repairs would be, you know, oil change repairs. You know, you go to a Jiffy Lube and you own 40 bucks, for example, um, which, which are affordable, right? That's not breaking the bank. Uh, so we, we have invested in kind of the wraparound maintenance to make sure there is somebody to call. There is someone to respond to, to the failure. But the actual costs, yeah. when, it, when it works well, I'll say, yeah. are, are incurred by the community. And, and can you put, uh, if this might be a dumb question, can you put a well basically anywhere? Or are there certain parts of the country of Africa yeah. or wherever that it's like, oh, well, well, it's not going to work. We need another method here. Because you, you talk about well, other ways of getting clean yeah. water. I mean, a couple of things. You know, well is a great solution when there is groundwater that is potable water. Okay. Um, and you know, I think there's there's sometimes... Uh, a misconception of, you know, wells drying up. I mean, Africa mm -hmm. has five times more groundwater than it needs really? over the next hundred years. Um, now, is it evenly distributed? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it all in the right places? No. So you, you, sometimes the water table is too low to, to drill a well or to drill a well cost effectively. Okay. Um, if the well is deeper, let's say than 150 feet, you need, a, you need a submersible pump that requires energy to get it out. If it's 150 feet, you can pump it out. Okay. So a lot of people are familiar with, you've probably seen the video, yeah. you know, people pumping a well. So that's 15 stories underground. You know, imagine getting an elevator, which is a drilling rig and, and pressing floor negative 15. And that's where your lake is. Uh, and then the standing water table comes up and you're, you're pumping it out, maybe even from, you know, from 50 feet or 60 feet. So there are a lot of factors that go into, um, you know, I'll give you two examples. In Cambodia, we, we fund the largest biosand filter program in the world. Think of that as like a giant Brita mm. that is, is, is filtering an entire family of eights water because there's surface water. There's actually a lot of surface water. It's just dirty. So that's about collecting the surface water, pouring it through the filter and cleaning it. In Rajasthan, India, we work in the Thar Desert. It's 120 degrees in the height of the dry season. The water table is far too uh, deep to drill effectively. Mm. But there, the monsoon rains come, and boy, does it rain like crazy for a month. So yeah. what we do there is we have rainwater harvesting systems. So underground cisterns that capture that month of rain, filter the water, and then store a year's worth of water. So you're, you're effectively a family there living off of the grid on rainwater harvesting supply. So those are just kind of three, you know, very different technologies, all with very different costs. But it all boils down to about $40 per person okay. on average. Okay. You know, which which is almost unbelievably cheap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think of, when you think of the things that cost us $40 now in our inflationary environment, and then you think of a, a human gaining access to clean water. That's crazy. Uh, you know, we think it's a great value proposition. 
I, I've got a really stupid question. I almost don't want to ask it because it's going to probably, I could probably. No, no, there's no stupid question. Well, I could probably just Google. It's, it's a question I've had my whole life and I've never actually tried to Google it. it can, can we, ocean water. Okay. Can we yeah, not take yeah, the salt yeah. out of ocean water? It. I mean, what what's sure, the. We can, we can, we can. And it's, um, it's very, very expensive. Okay. So in, in these communities, you know, you're talking sometimes a thousand X the order of magnitude of, of available cost, right? So, so you're building a capital infrastructure desalinization plant. Mm. Well, look, first, let me just say, this is how a huge part of the world gets their water. Um, oh. I fly through Dubai all the time on Africa. I think Dubai is 98 or 99% desalinated water. Oh, they're from, the, from the ocean. They're pulling water. That's how they're... In the ocean. However, a uh, couple of things. One, it requires a huge amount of capital cost to build the treatment facility. Number two, it requires a huge amount of ongoing energy. Mm. Oh, wow. and a lot of energy, right? Yeah. Not solar energy. We're talking, you know, oil energy. Um, and then number three, there's actually some environmental damage because you have this nasty brine, and people either bury the the high concentrate of salt or they put it back in the ocean. Mm. So you know, you would you would go and see that that's not a mm. non controversial yeah. issue. You know, dumping high concentrates of salt back into the ocean okay. after you pulled it out of the water. But it is and the costs are coming down okay. of both building the infrastructure. Again, in a in a rural setting where communities are making two or three dollars a day, uh it, it's it, it's not it's it's a non starter. Okay. Could you just if you could you just boil it? I mean like you'd would any other kind of contaminated water or whatever and obviously you can't <laughs> That's inefficient, but I mean, you absolutely if- can, and, and some communities will boil it. You know, that doesn't stop the walk, so that doesn't stop right. the fact that that water source might be six hours from your house, uh, round trip, right? Three hours out, three hours back. Um, it also uh, the the people are using cow dung in many of these communities, mm. which bur- burns at a really low temperature. Firewood is really precious. Uh, charcoal is very expensive. You know, there are laws against deforestation in so many of these countries. Mm-hmm. So the the firewood is is not as available as you... Well, I mean, you know, think about it. I, I don't know. I, yeah, if I go to the Publix, that little bundle of wood is like $8.99 <laughs> <That's now>. <laughs> right? It's like seven logs for the backdoor fire pit. You know, so, so even just think of how, how kind of expensive that is. So imagine, you know, building that fire at $9 a day to go boil, you know, a giant pot of pasta water. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it does work right. if they have the money and if they have the time to, to invest in that and to buy the charcoal. I was, I was telling you offline, um, we, we've got several friends from, from central Africa here and they, they saw uh, my wife showed them the video and everything. And, um, they were like, yeah, I used to, literally was yeah, yeah. Eight, eight years old and I used to walk two hours a day and all of them had, they were actually had clean water they're going to, but it was still you know, a good chunk of their day. And yeah, it's all, always the girls. Um, and oftentimes that affects education and everything. So, so now they're actually giving to charity water largely because they're oh, like, awesome. um, this was my life. And I, I, I didn't know that this could be, you know, solved like this. I mean, I'm curious. So you meant, um, it, you're, you're a believer, but your organization is not a, it's not a Christian organization. Did, was that a decision or tell us about how you, um, because that, that's a big decision well, to make early on. I kind of joked that when I started, I didn't know any Christians. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was in New York City uh, with 10 years of nightclub experience. I mean, I'd met, the, I'd met some Christians on this hospital ship in Africa, but yeah, I didn't know any in New York City. Um, so, you know, I joked that I, I couldn't have even started a Christian organization or, or a religious organization if I wanted to. Um, no, it, um, it, it was intentional. Um, you know, I am I'm animated by my personal faith and... Uh, I, I also just realized, you know, a huge, huge part of the world would never do what I do on a Sunday. Uh, <laughs> you know, a huge part of our yeah. potential donors who could stand for humans getting clean water would think I'm praying to an imaginary, fictitious God. Right. And, you know, why should they have to believe what I believe or, you know, worship the way that I worship um, to, you know, engage in something that is so universally good? You know, and I, I, I kind of get to live out my, you know, very simple theology every yeah. day in that I don't think the God that I believe in wants anyone to drink dirty water. Right. You know, I, I don't think uh, in, in heaven, like any woman is walking seven hours a day hmm. to a swamp. 
risking her life, you know, at, at risk of, of attack or rape or, you know, or injury. So, you know, it's been so fun to involve all people in that, mm. um, you know, our, our biggest donors, you know, have been atheists and agnostics. Really? <laughs> Your biggest and, ones? And our biggest ones. Um, that said, we have, you know, tens of millions of dollars of support coming from church communities, mm -hmm. from faith communities in, in the South. Um, we have synagogues that have been, you know, devout sub supporters of clean water. You know, I was telling you earlier, we had uh, Muslim school kids uh, in the Middle East send in $65,000 during Ramadan. Wow. That they had collected for clean water. So that was, that was really always the vision is to kind of keep promoting the idea of this universal common good, clean yeah. water for humans. Um, and maybe it's one of the only things in the world everybody can agree on. Yeah. I mean, Republicans think this is a good idea <laughs> and Democrats and libertarians and independents and Bitcoiners. Like, you know, everybody can say clean water is 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 needed for humans to flourish for humans to to have life uh, to have a meaningful healthy productive life so we've been able to build you know a very big tent of support um a really diverse tent of, of support and and i've loved that mm -hmm. um and i you know I, I don't i wouldn't go back and change anything about it uh, last, uh, I guess, as we round out the conversation, how, how can, if people are inspired, I imagine there's a few people out there at least that are, that are inspired, like, what are your needs? How can people get involved? Obviously, yeah. you know, giving money, a hundred percent of their giving goes to, you know, the cause, uh, are there other kinds of needs and, and it's fine. Our finances always like, if you got a billion dollars yeah. tomorrow, would everybody on the planet, I'd help a lot more like, is it, is it yep. just that it, simple or money issue? Or? It, it is now. And you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, it would have been a different answer, but you know, now with 17 years of experience, we know how to help a lot more people than we are raising the money for. You know, okay. the infrastructure is out there. There's over 2,500 locals, you know, consider them shovel ready waiting wow. on us to provide those resources. So, you know, you'd, you'd mentioned it earlier. I mean, we have a lot of families start by doing a, a ten or $12,000 project. They get to see exactly where the money goes. There's an element of choice there mm. of actually choosing a country. Sometimes people will adopt a child from one of these countries and say, you know, I'd love to support uh, in, in that country, you know, know that, you know, a couple hundred people are getting access to clean water. Um, you know, we have 131 families that support the overhead. So you never know. There's, there, there are those sacrificial givers who, who actually love coming in support of the team, of the staff salaries, of, of those necessary costs. And then probably the most universal thing is this community called The Spring, where it's just like Netflix or Spotify, except we don't give you any music and we don't give you any movies or TV. We just take 100% of your money every month and we distribute it to people who need clean water. Um, okay. And that is that has been really one of the most powerful things driving Charity Water's growth. Everyday people who give 10 or 20 or 40 or $100 every month, uh, dependably, reliably. And that has, you know, that actually, when we started that program, it helped us triple the size of the organization, powered by these small donations, but people, you know, who say, I I'm not going to just give once, I can do this mm -hmm. consistently. Yeah. So you can go and build these programs and count on this. So that's called The Spring. Okay. Um, people can just go to thespring.com. Uh, the video is there and you know, it takes 20 seconds to, to join. My friend, uh, Daniel Olson. Uh, do you know Daniel? I forget if you know him personally. I know he knows. I so. he, he, he just ran the New York Marathon uh, in, to raise awareness and money for um, Charity Water. He was, he was trying to run with, a, I think, a 40-gallon jug of water on his back but they wouldn't let yep. him it was we, actually you've had a lot of people do that i mean i'm, like, I'm impressed because it is that's it is lot. really heavy it, do, do people last question do people ever um yeah. i would imagine some people are like i want to go not just invest but i want to go see i want to go on the ground and yeah. see is that something that is even helpful or encouraged or is that kind of not is that getting in the way of what you're doing or yeah so you know we don't need anybody drilling wells so yeah. there's nothing um there's nothing to do except right. learn and to advocate. And so, so I do take anybody in that kind of group of people paying the overhead, uh, they're able to go, they're able to go with their children. Um, and, and, and that is like one of the few gifts we can kind of give them okay. for their sacrificial <laughs> giving. But yeah, I mean, there's no, it's not like a habitat for humanity right. where we need people to actually go out and drill wells. It's really, um, it's just advocacy when people come. 
you know, we, we want all that money to go and hire the next local yeah. uh, to then take that money. And, you know, at really at a fraction of the cost of, of us flying somebody over, yeah. you know, yeah. can actually deliver that uh, in, in the form of support. So. So the website is charitywater.org. Uh, what was the other one? The, uh, the spring? The spring.com. The spring. Yeah. And that's where people could check out the, the video that you mentioned as well. And then that helps yeah. us as well. You know, if, if somebody has nothing to give at the moment, you know, you could, you could watch the video and you could send it to some friends right. and say, you know, have, you, have you heard about this issue? Right. Have you heard about this organization? Right. It's, 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 it's an incredible, just the, the, I, I pay attention to video quality and how people kind of like you with the branding stuff. And I was so, bl- I'm like, who's this videographer? Who's this a director here? Cause this is so well done, man. Um, thank you for what you do, man. This is super inspiring. And I would, uh, highly encourage people to go at least, yeah, go check out. Uh, if you're not, if you haven't already go check out charity water and watch the video and, and go from there. So thanks Scott for being a guest on the awesome. and, and Hey, listen, thank, thank your wife for her support and, yeah. and her, her group. Um, that that means a lot. It's it's awesome when we hear of people who have actually experienced this issue. Yeah. You can tell them they're in the you know point oh one percent. Yeah, um, but we we really really appreciate that. That's super cool. I'll pass on the word, man. She'll she'll appreciate it. Yeah. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.